So next he says, we use the same simulator that they use at Princeton and we took a linchpins and we haven't even introduced a linchpins yet, but it would be a great introduction for it. And we took linchpins, this configuration of where six pentagons meet, and we put them in a particular order and we rebuilt the, pl the planet Saturn without gravity and it has the rings with no animation. It has the rings and the hexagon that's observed at the very top of it without dark matter, without dark energy, without gravity, showing that it's an outward, inward, outward force pushing down that creates the planet. So notably, uh, this exact thing uh, is inside of Walter Russell's The Universal One book from pages 208 to 213. So let's go, let's go there on his book real quick. Page 208 to 213. Almost there. Whoopsie. We want. Let's go to the double pages. Okay. So here we have the evolution of mass from plane to sphere. Oh. Hello. So we've got oblateness, planes, and then we have mass and plane in opposition. What is that? Well, that's, that's Saturn, right? So you essentially, what, what's being said here is that you've got a, a sphere with a certain amount of positive charge and negative charge, right? which is in balance, which makes it a sphere. And then the same way you have the elements surrounding, like carbon, for example, with the plus ones, the plus twos, the plus threes, and the minus ones, minus twos, minus threes. He's saying that that creates these shapes. And then if you combine those together, you get the, the balanced shape here, and then the, the unbalanced extreme shape there and that's why Saturn is Saturn because the middle is made of like carbon or hydrogen or something along those lines and then the the ring is made out of the other stuff like uh, let's go to his chart real quick so we can grab an idea uh, let's uh, let's say that uh, Saturn's inner part is made of silicon so the outer parts would be made out of like sodium or chlorine, basically, is, is essentially the, uh, the idea there. Uh, and and you, can, you could read this on your own, see exactly what he's trying to say. But essentially he's saying it's an extreme magnetic force going on to make the ring and a balanced magnetic and electric force to make the sphere. So then uh, Terrence Howard has this video which uh, he says, this, this is where he says that they're using the, uh, the same simulator from Princeton, right? This is the Harmonic Particle Simulation Planetary Saturn Hexagon Sim4 Blend in Blender. Uh, you can see here he, he, there's a, a sphere with some modifiers. There's another sphere up there above. Uh, you've got the torus. So here is the torus shape. If, is my cursor moving? Probably not. Let's use the, let's use the mouse. Mouse, are you awake? Okay. M now move. Okay. So this right here is our torus shape. All right. So they have they put a torus shape in here. Then they also have spheres. Uh, they they also have this ring torus right here. So you've got one large torus. You also have a much smaller torus, and the large torus is making this uh, vesica Pisces shape. And then you've got the smaller torus making a smaller ring. Uh, you've got all of these little uh, arrows pointing in. These are what he's equating to his linchpin shape. These are these vortexes over here on the right. And so you've got these spiraling vortexes. I th think they're pushing out. 
I, di I didn't put this together, so I'm just I'm just going off of what we can see here. Uh, notice these planes here. This is Euclidean space. We've got Cartesian coordinates. Just, you know, he's going to talk about that later. Um, so you've got you've got a lot of elements to this. And then when you play it, at some point, think about right here. Okay, they're they're gonna like press play, and s send a bunch of particles into this system. Yeah, you can see all kinds of different modifiers and things to to make all of these shapes. And then they're gonna throw particles into it at some point. Let's see here. Right about, oh yeah, right about there. They should have. They should press play. Yeah, they're just about to press play on it, and then you can see all the particles show up. And what do you know? It looks like Saturn. Maybe not exactly like Saturn, but you know, it's a it's a sphere with a ring around it. And then they say that this thing on top is a hexagon. I really don't see a hexagon there. I see a circle. I mean, you could pretend th that that's a straight line, but it's not really. Like sometimes it, it w with the with the motion of these particles, sometimes it's straight, sometimes it's not. This this is uh, th they pause it here and say that that is a hexagon. But you know, we were watching it; it's moving all over the place. You could call that an octagon, and it actually lines up better as like an octagon or a nonagon or dodecagon, all those things. Um, so th they're trying to claim that, and this is hollow, by the way. This is a, this is a, there's, there's like this layer right here of these uh, probably denser particles. I don't know, lighter particles. But whatever's going on, it, it, it's a bubble. There's, there's not, this is not a completely dense object. And so they're claiming that they recreated Saturn without gravity using the linchpins where six pentagons meet and they didn't have any dark matter or any dark energy or any gravity but what they did have was a whole bunch of spheres and a torus and a whole bunch of things pushing particles away from the center and where did the, where did those where did that vortex come from? Right, where, where did the torus come from? Because it didn't come from the vortexes that they had arbitrarily in the center here. These these little orange things, these vortexes, these vortexes did not create this torus. The torus is the bounding region that's cr oh, let's pause it here. Oh, back it up a little bit. The torus is the is the limit for this ring which is why the ring stops there because they put this torus here this ring right here that we saw earlier that's keeping this sphere from connecting i guess to this shape right here so you've got two completely separate shapes being constructed by all of these arbitrary limitations here if you wanted to make an actual model you would start with a, a fundamental principle like just the force of gravity just the force of gravity right and you know like the protons and the electrons which create this toroidal field through their aggregation of mass this toroidal field right now isn't being created by anything it's just put in there it was not created by the conditions of the particles that they threw in there the particles aren't doing anything but being pushed around by these arbitrary forces that aren't connected to anything so that's enough of that let's get back to this Okay. So we showed that uh, that exact thing was in the Walter Russell books. That's basically where they got the idea. Um, and we described the model. 
So Joe Rogan asks at this point, uh, and where does the matter come from? Right, but so he's asking where does the matter come from that's filling up this toroidal shape that they made, plus this ring shape that they made, plus all these little vortices that they put to push the matter out. He says, where do th where's that matter coming from? Terrence Howard replies, well, the matter, remember, that's condensation. If you were to picture the waves at the ocean, you know, the darker waves, the deeper the ocean, the darker the waves, the deeper the ocean, you can't see a distinguishing fact between them until they crash into each other. That splatter, that's We've drawn some waves. Um, that splatter, that little foam that comes out, it lasts for a couple seconds, and then it settles back on there, and it's just the balance between this force and this force. That's the physical universe. Those few seconds that it takes that matter, that more dense water in the foam, to recoalesce and get balanced again, with the surrounding environment, that's the entire time that our universe, or all these universes, have worked together. So the word condensation here is being misused. Uh, it's implying that matter already exists and then becomes visible as it condensates. This does not answer the question of where does the matter come from, however, because you're saying that it already exists and it's just condensing to become visible, like the way that water evaporates up into the sky and then condenses to become a cloud. He's saying that the, you know, the, the, the water already, already exists, but Joe Rogan asked him, where does the matter, right? Where's the original H2O, the hydrogen, the oxygen, where does that come from? He's just saying it already exists basically and that it's condensing. Um, However, the crashing wave analogy, analogy that he made does work better. The vibrations causing energy to form waves which interact and create fermion state matter out of boson state energy via spin, spin in energy field lines essentially, totally makes sense for how energy in a, in a space is vibrating, right, creating these ripples, and these ripples are overlapping, right, these are, these are waves crashing into each other, and it's creating these little areas where matter exists, and because it's a standing wave, right, so you have a standing wave it doesn't just up and down, it, it's up and down in the same place. And these wave little packets, for example, are not moving like this. I mean, they do sometimes, obviously, that's how you get motion. That's, that's why nothing can go fast in the speed of light. But uh, so this essentially, this little, this little wave bubble this standing wave bubble inside of the uh, electromagnetic field wave gets something happens to it, gets tangled up, becomes a fermion, right? It uh, it's spun around enough times, and the the fermion the fermion state essentially is this standing wave in this analogy, and that is how a boson becomes a fermion or how energy becomes matter. And the energy is already there. Where did it come from? We don't know. <laughs> we just don't we just don't know where that where that energy comes from. All we know is that it is a vibration in the electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field itself is the ether. 
that's being referred to, right? I don't know why I'm drawing curvy lines like that, but the electromagnetic field is, is that ether. It's, it's not a medium the same way that air and water are mediums. If it was, we would have figured that out by now. So then Terence Howard says, gravity is an effect of electricity. Now I've toyed with this idea myself. Uh, the basics of this idea is that we have this electron, whether or not it's a point particle or not, and we have a proton, which is part of a nucleus, right? And the proton and the electron are attracted to each other because their field lines line up. But the electron is also pushing out all over the place, right? Its electric field is all around it. And the proton is pushing out all around itself. And so the idea of the electromagnetic field, which is these field lines here, creating gravity is essentially that like this proton over here, this maybe, maybe this field line is like connected to it like that. And all of these field lines are connecting somewhere even though this proton already has its own electron buddy, right? And it's connected to it really strongly. And a lot of its fields are, are bending in, into it, right, right? Like that, right? A lot of these electromagnetic fields are collecting. But maybe some of them don't connect. And they're actually connecting to other electrons and other protons. Not very strongly just a little bit. In fact, the, uh, the magnitude is like negative 47 and negative eight or something. So the, uh, this, this would be gravity and this would be the electric field, right? And so if you have a, uh, you know, a collection of electrons chilling over here, have a collection of protons chilling over here or you know atoms that that their electrons went that way <laughs> they went and they went and hung out with some other atoms and so these are electrically positive these are electrically negative these are ions these are cations or the other way around and they are really strongly attracted to each other way stronger than this is attracted to this. And this connection here is way, way, way stronger than this connection here, right? So the, uh, the electric theory of gravity is essentially saying that this is gravity and this is electric force. And they're the same thing, but there's just like, there's just a li there's just enough bleed off from the uh, the electromagnetic field that's just barely pulling these bits of matter together and uh, you know I th you know a neutron is essentially some combination of an electron and a p proton together I think I think a little bit of mass energy gets launched out but that's how like a neutron star is formed right all the electrons and the protons get smashed together into neutrons and you get a neutron star. And there's you know, a bunch of energy that gets released and they're super dense. So even, even an electron, even though it's electrically neutral itself, it's still got like a tiny, tiny little bit of like, maybe, that, maybe it's not like a perfect arrangement of positive and negative charge inside that neutron. But like from a distance, it doesn't matter much but maybe there's just enough 
that it's got a little bit of pull on on protons from some directions and neutrons in other directions and it mostly balances out but maybe gravity is just this extra little bit of force coming from the electric field so that's my argument supporting <laughs> for once Terence Howard's idea that electricity and gravity are the same thing uh, that is not a rigorous theory there's no calculations done, no tests done, but it is a theoretic <laughs> it is a hypothetically testable hypothesis. We could run tests to see if that holds up. And so somebody who uh, has the equipment to do that should totally test that out so that that's that's the philosophy of the idea that electricity can cause gravity but it's not a proof it's just an idea right now it's a speculation because a hypothesis needs a testable thing you, you, you need to formulate a test and then you need to observe what actually happens and if that happens then you have a theory because like oh that was pretty close so we now have a theory because it's been tested and it's within our within our predictions that's how you form a theory what I just did right there that was a speculation that's just an idea okay so and it is a really fun idea uh, and if electromagnetism does have the effect of gravity, uh, it makes a lot of sense with like the curvature of light. Because if you have a really massive body and you have an electromagnetic wave moving or past that body, that electromagnetic wave actually curves. Because Einstein is talking about the curvature of space-time right so you've got uh, an um, Vsauce which way is down video is an amazing description of how time and space come together to uh, give us the effect of gravity but so if gravity is electricity that would make sense for bending electromagnetic field lines because that's what they do, right? You have a strong positive charge here and you have an, electric, an, an electronegative charge here. They're going to connect. That's how, that's how electromagnetism works. And I'm not saying this is magnetism and this is electricity. That's what Terence Howard says. This is positively electrically charged. This is negatively electrically charged. Magnetism is this. It's the, it's the torus field of the entire thing. With the electronegative and the electrically positive. <laughs> we'll put a P there for proton. And the reason it does that is because like iron has more like proton stuff going up over here and more electron stuff going on down here based on its molecular or you know it's, it's based on the way it does its thing they all they, they, they like to line up so that the electric charges are down here the negative charges down here and the positive charges down here or up here and then they all line up together forming a lattice which can be disturbed not all, not all iron is automatically magnetic. I mean, in, in the sense that it's not going to attract other iron. But if you get it all aligned, then iron automatically jumps in and starts lining up the same. Anyway, magnets. Magnets are cool. And the possibility that gravity is electricity is not completely out there. Um, so I am on board with this idea, uh, but it needs rigorous proof. To, to become a theory and if UFOs really are top secret government tech they are 
already using this. They already know all about it. Because those things don't give two shits about inertia or gravity. They're just going to wherever the heck they want. And uh, maybe it's because they know that uh, electricity causes gravity. And they, they have some way of vibrating their ship in a specific way that, uh, that creates a, uh, a way of interacting with, you know, it, it puts out a specific electromagnetic field uh, which makes it stable somehow on the Earth's magnetic field. Right, maybe, it's pr maybe it's like projecting little electromagnetic field stabilizers. Who knows? They've been working on that stuff since way before the 50s. Okay. Terrence Howard says, It is based on their lack of understanding because they don't know how the universe truly works because their math has been off for so long. This is, this is what he's talking about. Their math has been off for so long. Because their fundamentals are wrong. Now everything has this expiration and there's a loss to everything. When the universe... Okay, he's saying there's a loss to everything because when we're doing multiplication, we're not doing addition. So he's saying every time we do one times one equals one, we are losing one. That's the loss that he's talking about there. Let me continue. Uh, he says there's a loss to everything. When the universe is perfectly balanced, when you utilize it properly, and that's why I wanted to introduce the wave conjugations and the mirror shapes and all these defining the electric field, defining the magnetic field, and the constitution between them being the linchpin. Now, if we draw one of Terence Howard's tetratarian shapes, his concave tetrahedron, and then we have a electric force coming in at these angles, and we have a magnetic force coming out at these angles. If we connect those like this, you will notice that that does not look like anything that we actually see. That's not what an electromagnetic field looks like. An electromagnetic field looks like a torus. It has one flow going like this. And it, you know, it might have another flow going the other, the other direction, but it definitely has a flow going from the negative to the positive and back around like this. That's why apples are the shape, the way they're shaped. That's why oranges are the way they're shaped. You know, they actually have this in them. The earth probably has something going on like that too. The sun, probably the same. Saturn has a torus in it. It's because of the matter. It's because of the electric forces that the matter is made of. Doesn't look like this tetratarian shape. We don't, we don't see anything that looks like that. Uh, and so luckily, as, as I've shown, uh, the math isn't actually off. So we're not losing stuff. You know, we're, we're not constantly degrading by forgetting uh, a number every time we multiply one by one. So the fundamentals aren't actually wrong. And I can't fathom how that would be a loss anyway, because reality doesn't really care what you think. It's the same reality whether or not you know the difference between multiplication and addition. I'm also really not seeing the connection between the concave polyhedrons 
arbitrarily arranged and and Terence Howard's inconsistent version of basic math. What does this shape have to do with one times one equaling one to Terence Howard? Nothing. Literally nothing. Terence Howard says the linchpin, as you, you'll see in a minute, it has the same center that that tetratarian space. The magnetic field, the feminine side, all of this is circular, that's the full expansion. This is the common factor or the constitution between the micro and the macro. That's what the linchpin was. Uh, so the linchpin is a neat shape. Let's, uh, let's go pull that up real quick. Not that, uh, yeah, it's, it's on the same vein as this. Let's just close that, go back to his book. Okay, so here's the linchpin. So it's a neat shape, and it can stack with itself in three-dimensional space. Uh, Terence Howard is equating it to the magnetic field because these lines, where am I? These lines right here uh, are basically the same lines that are inside of this shape right here. If you were to go from the center and draw lines out, it's, it's making that same shape between the pentagons. Uh, the things that he's calling the vortices. Uh, he's calling it the feminine for some reason, uh, I guess because of Walter Russell did, even though masculine would actually be more fitting as it is an outward flow. Uh, he is saying that the constitution between the micro and the macro, because you can tessellate 3D space with this shape, uh, so you can start small and tessellate it and, and make a big shape with a bunch of these. Um, Although it should be called a uh, a what, what did he say? He said it's uh, it's the constitution between the micro and the macro. He should say it's a constitution between the micro and the macro because there are many ways to tessellate three D space. Terence Howard says. You know what's going on. We're about to kill gravity. We're about to kill their god gravity, and they don't want that. Uh, gravity will still exist. It's just a label for a natural phenomenon. And we already fly through the air with planes in defiance of gravity. If the general public uh, find a particular resonant frequency or a manipulation of the uh, electric fields that allows us to ignore or be repelled instead of attracted to masses of matter and energy, a lot of people will be very happy about it, actually. <laughs> and it won't kill gravity. Gravity will still be there, being exactly what it's always been. Uh, so the next bit is about recreating Saturn. Um, and we already played that video, well, parts of that video. So he says, so you can change the angles of incidence. Remember, that means color or tone or you know octaves that that these linchpins because you remember each one of these has these are opposing vortices so there's 12 vortices to this he means inside of inside of this little pentagon right you've got a vortice he says there's a vortice going one way and a vortice going another way there's six of them so that's 12 vortices so there's 12 vortices to this that are opposing. So once the angles of incidence change, you can, you change the motion and pressure conditions. You can now change the conditions or crystallization it all. So I was saying with the periodic table, now because we have the angles of incident, material engineering can now separate the space between carbon and nitrogen or carbon and boron and have the same elements of titanium, vanadium, chromium, mag manganese, and iron or nickel, copper, zinc, gallium, or germanium in those higher octaves. We can do that between silicon and phosphorus, or silicon and aluminum. Let's, let's go over to that thing real quick. Um, this one, here we go. So you, just so you can have a visual representation while he's talking about it. Uh, so continuing on, so you can we can do that between silicon and phosphorus or silicon and aluminum. So the transparent aluminum now becomes possible 
because we can now control the pressure and motion conditions where we couldn't do that before because they were going by Cartesian space at 90 degrees and 45 degrees, straight lines, the Euclidean space they've made up, this orthogonal or church-like space they've generated because they wanted to promote that cross. That was the basis of all that. Now we've opened ourselves up. This is what happens when four bubbles meet. He's holding the linchpin up, uh, made of six pentagons. This is the negative space from when four bubbles are meeting. That's hydrogen. So that's a, that's a mouthful. So angles of incidence, again here, means a specific frequency in an octave, right, these octaves. Uh, as relating to Walter Russell's diagram. So changing an angle of incidence is supposed to change hydrogen into carbon, for example. The claim, is, uh, the claim here is, again, that there are hidden elements surrounding the elements like silicon with greater oxidation states than plus three and minus three. It's a very silly claim, honestly. Apparently, arranging the periodic table in straight lines is the issue and nothing to do with the fact that the number of protons in the nucleus actually determines the element. And there are no gaps around silicon, no matter how you arrange the elements on a diagram. Euclidean space isn't made up, it's a description. The real structure of space-time may be hyperbolic, but from this vantage point, it looks Euclidean. That doesn't mean it is Euclidean, but the structure doesn't behave differently regardless of how it appears to be. Also, more, ch more random church bashing. I'm, I'm not even religious and I find it to be silly. The linchpin is now also hydrogen because it shares angles with a tetrahedron, which Terence Howard has declared, but not shown in any way that it is hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen has a, uh, an oxidation state of plus one, zero, or negative one even though, according to Walter Russell, it was supposed to be four and four. He equated it to the tetrahedron, the concave tetrahedron, because of that four and four, but in actuality, it's one and one and zero. So, false equivalence. Uh, he says, I've got a patent where you don't need projectiles in the guns anymore. So, uh, if he does, it's not a patent with the US PTO. What he's talking about here is a container of water that you send electricity into that somehow, and somehow that alone, causes the electricity to create more energy than you put into the water and shoot out lightning, which Terence Howard will call both a gun and a propulsion system. Terence Howard says, like, if you picture dropping a pebble into a pond or a pool, everything expands in these longitudinal waves, perfect spheres, unless there's something else in there. But when it hits the edge, it all starts bouncing its way back. And when it meets, when these returning waves meet expanding waves, that's when we get our first geometry. So this is a proof that the universe is not infinite but finite because you could not have a shape without the returning waves and the waves would not return unless it was bouncing off of the edge of something. Uh, this is a good argument for some sort of boundary but not a definite final edge to existence. A closed system doesn't imply that nothing exists outside of it. Uh, Terence Howard then says, we rebuild the Milky Way, and it predicts the star arrangement better than NASA does. And this is without dark matter, without dark energy. This is without the standard model. Okay, now he's talking about like electrons and protons and stuff, because that's, that's the standard model, all the particles. He said, Terence Howard says, they couldn't get out of the ether, so they assumed that there was no ether out there, and that's when particle physics took off. So space-time, or Einstein relativity, came as a result of them taking ether away. One second, I need a drink of water. I 
throat's starting to get really dry. Okay. So, he's made some extraordinary claims here, but he has no evidence. He has... He has uh, there's nothing to do but, but say. Uh, well, let's see it then. Uh, so he, s he said that like, that they can recreate the whole galaxy with more accurate positions than NASA. I didn't see it. He said he could recreate Saturn. We saw something, but just because it was Saturn-ish doesn't mean that it was Saturn. And with all those arbitrarily placed, you know, spheres and, and toruses and stuff, you're, you're not proving anything. You're proving that you can, you can make a Saturn-like shape if you arrange a bunch of arbitrary things together. You're not proving that those arbitrary things are why Saturn is the shape that it is. So, I'm not on board with or against the concept of ether, uh, but the tests that Terence Howard refutes that concluded that there was no ether worked on certain assumptions, but if those assumptions were incorrect, the results are incorrect. However, arbitrary claims also don't matter. General relativity has nothing to do with whether or not there are mediums present. General relativity works underwater, in atmosphere, and in space. So if there is an ether, it works there too. Going up against relativity is the great folly of many. It's a very simple, easy to observe principle, and the time-space implications have been directly observed. GPS satellites have to account for time dilation to stay accurate. That's just one of many proofs of general relativity. Now, it doesn't mean that, that there actually is a space-time field, right? That's just, that's, that's an abstract concept to describe what we see happening. We, we put the label space and time on it, right? But the math of general relativity does actually predict real things that we see. So we know within a certain level of, of certainty, right? Because Newton's laws of gravitation were within a certain level of understanding. It just couldn't predict Mercury's orbit properly. Einstein's general theory of relativity is really, really accurate to what we actually see in reality. All right. Terence Howard then says, and for 100 years, we've walked down this particle physics world that's all theoretical. And here I've patented these wave conjugations that is the ether, the contraction of the ether and the expansion of it. And on top of that, the proof of it was I've been able to build new industries from it. Okay. So theories are all anyone will ever have, for one. They are the most robust way to determine the nature of physical reality from within physical reality. There is, a, there is wild speculation, which is built on the flimsiest of bases, then normal speculation, then hypothesis, where you have a way to test an idea, and theory, which is a hypothesis which has been tested and the results were within the scope of the predictions. Terence Howard claims that his wave conjugations, or concave polyhedra, are the ether. But as I've thoroughly investigated with the utmost charity and desire to understand and decipher what Terence Howard is actually saying and actually claiming, there's no consistency to the claims. There's no evidence, not even a hypothetical experiment to prove any of this. There's no actual practical applications proving it. It's just bundles of shapes and a lot of claims. Geometry is fun, and you can arrange shapes in all sorts of cool ways, but that in itself has no inherent meaning. Terence Howard has demonstrated that he can put shapes together. Nothing else has been demonstrated. He claims that he built new industries, plural. What are they? Where are they? If this is a proof of anything, 
Let's see it. Terrence Howard says, or actually, Joe Rogan asks Terrence Howard first, how does the sun give birth to these planets? Uh, so we're now getting back into the Walter Russell stuff. Uh, Terrence Howard says, the same way that we defecate and have gas. That red spot on Jupiter that's spinning on it, that's going to become a moon. It may take a billion or two billion years that will ultimately become a moon off of Jupiter. Where, where's it at? Right at the equator. Where do we discharge at? Right at the equator. And then it will rotate around and slowly be pushed out by the solar wind of, well, by Jupiter. Joe Rogan says, so like a coronal mass ejection. And then Terrence Howard says, coronal mass ejections. It's not just like materials that's been left over by the Big Bang. <laughs> okay, so these are just more concepts from Walter Russell's book, The Universal One, and all of that's already been addressed. And it's frankly quite silly. One, that he thinks that it's, that anyone is saying that the planets are just materials left over from the Big Bang. Now, stars have these things called planetary nebula, and the star forms out of that nebulous gas as it comes together. And when it has come together enough, it gets actually dense enough to start nuclear fusion, which takes two hydrogen atoms and smashes them together with so much pressure that it becomes helium and lets out a bunch of energy. And that's how hydrogen is formed into helium. You don't unwind from hydrogen to get to higher elements. You smash hydrogen into itself at incredible pressure. And that forces the atoms together until they enter into a stable state, which is helium. And that continues up the chain until iron and after that stars normal stars don't make elements past iron you have to have a supernova explosion or some other incredibly strong event creating pressures way beyond anything that Terence Howard is imagining to create all of these higher elements so Walter Russell says that it is the lack of pressure away from the stars that creates the heavier elements. And actual cosmology of stars, the birth and death of stars, shows that when you smash these things together, you have nuclear fusion, which creates the denser elements out of less dense elements just like adding two things together. Anyway, also, the, the, the Jupiter is shitting out a moon from the red spot. He actually thinks that. And coronal mass ejections don't just happen at the equator of the sun. Sorry to rain on your parade, Terrence. Doesn't work like that. We can watch coronal mass ejections happen from all over the, all, all kinds of different sides of the sun. So, Terence Howard says, they can't explain the morphic resonance that's happening between things like right now because I've discovered these wave conjugations. Every person on the planet that's been thinking about it will now have ideas concerning it, but not just us, but all humanoids throughout the entire universe will now get that same resonance and be able to apply it like the experiments with the rats. You teach the rats something here in London, and in New York you find the rats are doing the same thing spontaneously because of the morphic resonance, because we are all connected on this ether and that waveform. That's the consciousness. We are all just one great being. You know, that's why they forget. We are not separate. The universe probably one cell, or the universe is probably one cell inside of some superorganism. And we're just little who's like Horton hears a who and trying to make sense of it. And it's a beautiful thing that we are making sense of it. 
but everything is just one great being. We're all God. That's what Jesus was talking about. That's what Buddha was talking about. That's recognizing the divinity in you. What I did as a child, I said, I'm going to, instead of waiting for the Messiah to show up, Messiah to show up, what if everybody picked up the torch and did everything that they expect the Messiah to do? What if everybody, just for one day, walked around and behaved as if they were God himself and did the things that they would expect the Creator and we know God can't just be a male because no man can produce a child without a female. Everything in the universe, as above, so below, like Billy Carson always talks about. You can't, everything has an equal and opposite. It has to mate. Mating is a big part of what we do. The boron mates with nitrogen and that's how carbon happens. Everything inside of us, all our cells, they're mating. There's a relationship going on in it. Everything's alive. There is no death. But the Bible talked about a me mechanistic world. God took dirt and blew into it the breath of life and it came to life. But if you look at the Brownian effect, what is breathing going from positive to negative? And they see all these, even the plastic that makes these things up, are still going from, it's still carbon, polarizing from positive to negative, breathing in, breathing out. It's just under a different state of matter, but there is no death. There is no death. We are all, everything is eternal. And once we forget, once we get rid of the idea of, okay, you're going to die and disappear, then they don't have anything to grasp onto anymore. And to be free, the truth will set you free. You know, that's why I was like, okay, well, if I have to, if this truth calls me this lifetime, then wonderful. I have accomplished what I need to do. All right, that's a lot. We're going to go through it. So morphic resonance has been called the hundredth monkey effect. It is not widely accepted. Uh, I personally have experienced that all beings have a field structure of some sort around them that looks and behaves in the same fashion as electromagnetic fields behave. And I have experienced thoughts and feelings creating literal wave pulses that travel through these fields from one being to another becoming a shared experience. Though without being aware of the source, it is experienced firsthand as though it is your own thought or feelings, even if you can't understand why you have that thought or feeling. It takes a very thorough self-awareness to notice the nuances and very specific states of mind to literally see the field structure around your body or another being's body. The mind filters these fields out in our default awareness, but with the right attention, anyone can literally bring them into focus, in, into the focus of the conscious awareness and see it for themselves, and many have. Uh, giving it a name like morphic resonance doesn't really seem helpful. It is what it is, no matter what you call it. What it reveals, however, is that our minds are connected and thoughts which have measurable frequencies do transfer through these fields. Uh, where Terence says we are all one great being, essentially, it comes down to literal energy itself. The words consciousness, God, and energy are all synonymous. A living being is defined by being animated under conscious control. Our bodies and minds are animated by electricity. A brain with no electrical activity is defined as dead. A heart with no electrical, electrical activity does not beat. The energy within the electricity that flows through the body is the consciousness. Now I'm making claims, but this claim holds up to scrutiny. You can focus your conscious awareness anywhere in your body and begin to feel not just that part of the body, but an energy that builds there like a pressure. You can create heat in your hand by allowing this sensation to increase by continuing to focus on it. The focus is the focus of the consciousness. You don't have to physically look at your hand to increase the sensation in it. Anyone listening to this can literally try this right now. If the sensation becomes very strong, you can generate literal heat in the hand or anywhere in the body through conscious focus alone. This is what Wim Hof does with his breath techniques. He increases the literal energy in the body through excessive breathing 
which increases the physical sensations all throughout the body, increasing the conscious awareness all throughout the body, and then transforms the energy into body heat, allowing him to endure extremely cold temperatures. Breath is not the only way to increase energy in the body. It can be done with awareness alone. Breath just makes it really easy. All energy is energy, whether it's kinetic or thermal or potential. It's all one energy. It cannot be created or destroyed, which means it is eternal. It creates everything, all form. So scientists and religious folk may be using different terminology, but they're describing the same existence. As for death, bodies, forms are created and destroyed. Energy changes forms. The energy remains. For a person, a body, a brain, there absolutely is death, but not for energy. That is what Terence Howard means when he's saying there is no death. His message about picking up the torch instead of waiting for a savior is a very apt message. You are the one who navigates your ship on the seas of existence. However, boron mates with nitrogen and, and that's how carbon happens? Boron has five protons. Nitrogen has seven. If mating boron and nitrogen together through nuclear fusion created anything, it would probably create magnesium, which has 12 protons. Unless we are losing protons in the process or just trading one proton from nitrogen to boron. That must be what he means, but mating them in the ionic fashion, uh, as was being discussed earlier, isn't making any carbon. Uh, and the Bible, when, when he said the Bible talked about a mechanic, a m mechanistic world, did he read the Bible? I mean, surely it had a lot of stories, but there's a lot of talk about being still, which is a reference to meditation and knowing I, we're, we're all I, am God. So your consciousness is energy, which is what they're calling God because it's energy is what creates and destroys all form. It is eternal and it itself cannot be created or destroyed. So that I, that consciousness awareness of you, that unis that is always there, except when you're unconscious, but that's just not being aware of consciousness. It doesn't mean the consciousness is gone, it just means you're not aware. That's another duality state from awareness to not awareness. That I, if you meditate and you become still, you will see you will experience something beyond physical reality. That's what Kundalini is, that's what astral projection is, that's what people experience when they do DMT. DMT and Kundalini feel exactly the same. I've done both. Energy is energy, and the energy that animates your body is the real you. And that's the part that doesn't die. But th your, your memories, your thoughts, your personality, all that stuff, that all, that all goes away. That's j And that's what people call the ego. But anyway, we're getting off subject here. Um, but yeah, so the breath of life in the Bible is the energy riding the lightning or the electricity, which does indeed give life to dirt, which is an analogy for physical matter. Terrence Howard is so against the church that he doesn't even understand what he is railing against. He says, if you look at the Brownian effect, I assume he means Brownian motion, which is apparent chaotic motion. Brownian motion is the apparent random motion of particles suspended in a medium. Uh, maybe he thought, or maybe he brought up Brownian motion to describe how his mind moves from subject to subject. <laughs> Sorry, Terrence, I'm just got to riff a little bit. Okay, so the next thing that he says, uh, it's supposed to, but take a, take a balloon, another thing that kills gravity. Gravity is supposed to be the greater mass, the greater the attractor. You take a balloon, you rub it on your leg, you put it over the ground, watch the dust particles jump off the ground, off this big mass called the Earth, and jump onto that balloon, because why? Electricity is 137 times stronger than the pull of gravity, or the effects of so-called gravity. It's the electric force that's the attractor force. It's the electric force that tightens everything together as the masculine. And the 
And then the dividing force is the radiative force. The magnetic field, it oblates and pushes everything out. And then they collect together again. But where do these things meet? At the proper angles of incidence, like the Birkeland currents talked about, those plasma currents talked about, those angles of incidence at 120 degrees. Uh, now he, he brings up 120, deg 120 degrees because that's the uh, the arc in the tetrahedron, basically. Uh, when it converts back into electricity, and it will keep collecting and coming and making like the planet isn't a dead thing, it just didn't happen to come together. That's just a process by which it was given life. It's alive, and it's screaming. <laughs> It thought we were going to be beneficial to it, and now it's trying to kill us. Now it needs to scratch itself and get rid of us because we are too dangerous, because we are using antiquated fundamentals. Okay, so he says, a balloon kills gravity. Now he's talking like a flat earther again. Buoyancy. Anyway, if you don't know why static electricity is stronger than gravity at short distances, you might want to go study basic physics. The electrostatic force is 39 orders of magnitude greater than the gravitational force. Not a mere 137 times, uh, as much as I love the number 137. Uh, Terence Howard hasn't yet grasped how dividing by two can be equivalent to an exponent of three though. So I can understand if he doesn't understand that uh, 10 to the negative eight uh, versus 10 to the negative 47. Uh, so electrostatic forces are a lot stronger, but they only take effect when there is an imbalance of net charge. The strength does not allow for a lot less in terms of electrically charged mass to have effect over distance. Sorry. Uh, so the, the strength of the electrostatic force does allow for a lot less in terms of electrically charged mass to have an effect over distance, but gravity still beats static cling with the entire mass of the Earth until you get to a short distance between the positively charged and negatively charged much smaller objects. The Earth is trying to kill us, apparently, because one times one equals one. Be we'll be because we think that one times one equals one, which we've proven, right? It's just an annotation for a concept of doing addition faster, <laughs> basically. But just because you're doing addition faster doesn't mean that one times one is equal to one plus one. We've covered it. That's one, one time. So he's, he's saying that the Earth is trying to kill us because the Earth is a living thing and it thought that we were going to be beneficial for it, but then we went and screwed up by saying that one times one equals one, so now the Earth has to kill us. Has to scratch its back. That's just about the most absurd claim that he's made yet. And so those darned Anunnaki tricking us with basic math. Luckily, one times one does equal one. It's just confusing for some people who didn't properly grasp mathematical notation and how it relates to actual reality. The Earth is just earthing. It's not trying to kill us. It didn't think we were beneficial for it. It's just doing its Earth thing. Uh, Terence Howard then says, the entire ARVR world was built off of my first patent that was abandoned because I paid $260,000 for the worldwide patent, but then my agents kept, my lawyers, my lawyers kept sending me these maintenance fees and annuities, and I'm like, these fucks are just trying to shake me down. I'm not going to pay this. Well, a year later, if you pull up my World of Windows patent, I think it's one of the first patents up there. I want you to see, oh, let's, let's go back to it. Let's go back to his patents. Okay. He says, uh, 
I want you to see where AR VR world came from. You look at the list of companies that have cited and didn't just cite, they built the entire AR VR world off of my world of Windows patent. Let's let's uh put in world of Windows patent, see if we can get the one with the uh with the pictures on it. All right. Um, is it this one? Yep, here we go. OK. So we've got the United States patent application publication. Publication date, October 28th, 2010. And you can see all these little diagrams. You've got a person. You've got all these different uh, references to various parts of the text, which the other text does cover. The other, the other text we're looking at just didn't have the pictures in it, basically. But otherwise, it's the same thing. So you've got like a picture of a computer tower. You've got the cloud as a literal cloud. <laughs> uh, you've got all these different monitors. You've got a router, a, a phone computer tower, hard drives in it, You've got a laptop, You've got a picture of a dude standing with something on his chest, You've got your uh, computer tower down here, you've got some windows arranged around a room. Uh, now we have a more three-dimensional view, it's kind of on its side, uh, but you can see like that's a window, that's a window, and he's like saying like have your keyboard out here, and you know if, if you've used uh, if you've used uh, the Oculus Rift, for example, they do have like little keyboards. Not it doesn't look exactly like this, but like you uh, you you point at the letters and you you can uh, type by pointing your little handheld device at the letters that are projected in front of you. Not on a window; they're just they're just project projected in space in front of you. Um, then you've got all these different like probably projectors. That's what that looks like. I don't think this document specifically. Yeah, th this document doesn't uh, doesn't show how many people cited this thing, but I mean we're looking at the actual applied for patent that was never granted. Uh, it does not say anything about how to actually like. It has nothing about what what's the mechanics of this. What's the technological it, it, it talks about the position and the angle that it's facing. It talks about, it's a, it's a user interface, basically. It's just a design patent. It has no technological application at all. There's no technological specifications in this. Somebody else has to go through the work of actually making it. And then if they, if they set it up in this way, okay. That's one of the ways they could set it up. None of the none of them have actually set up their stuff in this exact way. Not one. The the closest thing that I've seen is this right here. Just this. That's the closest I've seen and it it doesn't get projected onto a wall. It just gets projected into a space. I've played with the Oculus Rift before. Okay. So he filed for the patent in 2010. It was never officially granted. He abandoned it in 2013. He didn't invent augmented reality or virtual reality, and his patent describes a way that an interface might be set up, but there are no technological innovations. You can read it yourself. This patent is actually listed on the USPTO, and it's easy to find. Anyone who actually created AR VR technology put in real work that has nothing to do with this patent. Definitely no trillions of dollars that would be owed to him. I could draw a car and say that it's going to have six wheels. Right? So here's here's my here's my car. We're gonna we're gonna set it up. It's gonna have a window right here. And then it's gonna be a 
a tube like this, and it's going to be transparent because it's a window. And then there's going to be a steering wheel in the middle and a seat. And then you're going to have more seats behind it. And then there'll be a trunk space back here. And there's going to be some lights. Here's your trunk, fenders, hood. These are your doors for getting in and out of the car. And it's going to have six wheels. And uh, these wheels will turn. And they'll turn uh, 80 degrees each, I guess. Um, right? Uh, th this is the equivalent of, of Terrence Howard's thing, plus a whole lot of, of writing describing it all. Oh, and there's also going to gonna be a glass floor on the bottom so that you can see the road beneath you. And that's my that's my cars of windows. I'm going to patent this. I'm not really, but you, it, that's that's the idea. So, oh, and also these doors, they don't they don't swing outward. They actually slide like this. Um, but there's there's no specifications of like drive shafts. There's nothing about the mechanics of the engine, not even the hinges of the doors. Literally nothing technical at all. This is just a window dressing. Uh, I doubt Terrence Howard would ever show the actual data on where he got his seven trillion dollar figure, but I bet he took it from imagining all of the actual work and actual creations created by every company that even bothered to acknowledge that his patent existed and the profits or potential profits that they earned from their actual creations. Okay, so he continues. But what they didn't know, what they didn't understand is how this is really supposed to work. So they've just been taking this gun and been using it as a bat and if they wanted to know, I could show them how it really works. This is proof that my stuff is legit. Uh, I'm sorry, Terrence, but a claim with no evidence of any kind isn't proof of anything, except perhaps a proof of the nature of the claimant. Uh, so Joe Rogan asks, when the Saturn V rocket is escaping Earth's atmosphere, what is it fighting against? So let's draw an Earth. And a Saturn V rocket. And this Saturn V rocket is going to go like this to escape. Because it's easier than going like this. Earth is rotating. This is what... Terrence Howard says. What that's fighting against is the rotation. Remember, there's a centripetal spin that's taking place with the Earth. Centripetal is a force pulling inward, so gravity. There's a centripetal spin that's taking place with the Earth, and there's an electric field that's generated from that. That's the centripetal spin that holds things inside. That's what it's fight fighting against. Now, in order for there to be a centripetal force, you have to be physically connected to the object that you are spinning around. It's not an object that is spinning that creates a force inward. It's an object that, that you are spinning around, attaching you to it. Right? This thing doesn't even have to move. This rope, this tension that's holding this thing to whatever this is, this pole, like maybe this is a tetherball, that's what's creating the centripetal force. 
if you don't have this rope here, if this thing spins and this thing's not attached to it, there's no force, create. there's nothing to create a centripetal force. There's still gravity, but that's different. Anyway, centripetal force. So, uh, let's, where, where were we? So he says that centripetal spin that holds things inside, that's what it's fighting against. That's the electric field. Remember, he says the electric field comes in like this, into the Earth. And he says that the magnetic field comes out of the Earth. Let's, let's use red. The magnetic field is coming out this way, right? Magnetic and electric. Okay, uh, where were we? He says, that's what it's fighting against, that's the electric field. We're calling it gravity, but gravity is just the effect of the electric field, and the electric field is balanced by the radiative field. The more mass something has, the greater the elect, I, I put in that part, the more mass something has. Uh, he says, the greater electric potential it has. You know, the tighter the waves are. The waves are tighter, the electricity can now it doesn't have to jump over anything. And as I sh <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it doesn't have to jump over anything. And as I showed you with some of the pieces, as long as they are close together, then you don't have a magnetic field that forms that discharge because they're able to stay northeasternly in their direction, they're not forced to go southwesternly and spin up. Either you're spinning to the right or spinning to the left. That's the only two directions in the universe. Spinning to the right is northeastern, that's electric. Spinning to the left, it's magnetic. Uh, and that, that's referencing uh, this thing over here. Where is it? This one, okay. so. So that's, that's literally referencing this diagram here, where you have, so you've got north and south, you've got the west and the east. Yeah, so this is northwesternly, and this is, uh, that's, that's what he said, right? North, oh, he said northeastern. He said northeastern, that's electric. Or, hold on northeasternly and southwesternly and spin up you're either spinning to the right or spinning to the left it's the only two directions in the universe it's northeastern that's electric yep see you've got the sphere of electric right here in the northeastern quadrant of this diagram and then he says Spinning to the left and south. That's the magnetic one. Oh, he got... South is down here. Electric is over here again. So northeastern is electric. Southwestern is electric. Northwestern is magnetic. And southeastern is electric. So it sounds like he got that a little confused. Or maybe he's changing it up. His own, his own idea. Uh, he says... Uh, <coughs> and it's expanding out. It contracts in fifths and it expands in sixes. Uh, he says, I've invented a, f a new form of flight, tangential flight, the ability to fly around your own center of mass, something they've never been able to do. Uh, it's the linchpin thing he's talking about here. And you don't hear anything about it and it's unlimited bonding. People can do it by falling, but this is a sustained system. <coughs> so, uh, back to my little drawing here. Fighting against the rotation of the Earth. Terrence Howard is probably thinking about the ether, ignoring the air itself, I guess. 
and knowing apparently nothing about the basics of rocket science and the actual laws of motion, which are called laws because they are actual, the actual direct experience of reality. Centripetal force isn't a real force. He's saying centripetal because it's the direction or because the direction of the force is toward the center of the rotation. So in Walter Russell ideology, that means it's an electric force. We say there is centripetal force on a ball tethered by a rope swinging around a pole, which causes the ball to move in circular motion around the pole, but it's not an actual force pulling the ball toward the pole. The ball is, shockingly, moving in a straight line while the rope is preventing that straight line of motion. The force applied, which curves the ball's path is the tension of the rope. He doesn't mention centrifugal in this quote, but he does in other videos. He of course equates that to the magnetic force because it is a force moving outward away from the center. Centrifugal force is also not a real force. It is inertia. When you spin around with your arms limp, they will be drawn up and outward because they are attempting to move in a straight line but they are attached to your body. The tension in your arm keeps it attached to your body, applying a centripetal force, while the centrifugal force, or the inertia, sends them outward. This is inertia, or this inertia is also why rotating spherical bodies bulge in the middle, the, at the equator, like the Earth. It's not magnetism, it's not electricity, it's inertia and tensile strength. You can literally test this. Spin around with a tennis ball in your hand and let go of the tennis ball. It will move in a straight line from the location in which it was let go in the direction it was moving when it was let go until the force of gravity acting upon it causes it to hit the earth or any other collision. So if we look at you from the top, right, you're, you're a dude. You've got a tennis ball in your outstretched hand. Here's your tennis ball. You rotate in a circle and you let it go. When you let it go, if you let it go right, he right here, it's going to go that direction based on the amount of force that you put into it, and that's a straight line. However, there is a force acting upon it, which is the gravity of the Earth. So if we look at you from the side, right, here's your, here's your dude, here's your hand, here's your ball, you let your ball go, it wants to go straight, but because you're standing on the Earth, it goes down as well at 9.8 meters per second squared with the force of gravity and boop, 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 your ball hits the ground. And yeah, that's a curve. But if you look at it from the top, it's straight. And if there was no gravity, because you weren't on the Earth or anywhere near anything, it would just go straight. And that's Newton's laws of motion. An object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by a force. An object at rest, and we're talking relative here. We've got two objects at rest, just chilling in space. They're so, they're so light that this distance between them is gonna attract them together through gravity in like seven days or something. And then here comes a little particle and it goes bonk, and it bonks into this one. And now the particle bonks off in this direction and this massive object is now going that way and now it's in motion it's not accelerating I mean it's, it's accelerating towards this thing but it's not strong enough compared to the force that's moving in this direction it's gonna pretty much go that way forever until it bumps into something else Okay, so he says he invented a new form of flight. Uh, and he has a little video where he's got his little pe Pentagon linchpins. Let me see if I can draw one here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So he's got his... That's, uh, I don't think that's how he has it set up. Here's a... Doo -doo -doo. Is it like that? And then the other one comes off here, I think. Connects to those. And then there's, oh no, no. It's like, they, they, they connect, they, they connect 
on a plane like this, right? On a tetrahedral plane. So we can just draw them based off of that thing. Gosh, I'm terrible at this. Uh, all right, so this one over here, that one over there, this one over here, and then you can have another one right here, and another one basically right there, right? Yeah. Okay, so here, so here's his linchpin, right? And he has a he has a video where they have these little circles inside of them, and they have little propellers. And he calls this tangential flight, and the idea is, you know, they can they can put force in either direction on on all twelve all in, in twelve different directions and that this thing is gonna fly around. So this is his new form of flight, and because it has all these different rotors on it, it can like rotate in place. Uh, and that's, that's where his reference of like a dude falling can, can rotate in place while falling. Um, so I have yet to see one of these linchpins actually fly except in a computer-generated concept video where they fly with propellers. There's no mechanism for the actual rotation of the propellers. Uh, and there's these little grabbing arms that kind of pop out of nowhere. Uh, when he had these objects actually flying around and grabbing and lifting things in the video, uh, or sorry, I, I meant to say, uh, when he has these objects actually flying and actually connecting and actually grabbing and lifting things, then he can make the claim that he has invented a new form of flight. Uh, but you don't hear anything about it because he hasn't actually done it. And the, uh, the unlimited bonding is a reference to the, the ability for these objects to tessellate in 3D space. Uh, there is no proposed method for how these supposed flying objects will actually bond in any meaningful, secure, practical way. And uh, people can do it by falling. That's not flying. Anyway. He continues. Uh, because this is the geometry of hydrogen. We're talking about this thing now. So now this is also hydrogen. any bond that hydrogen can make, the linchpin can make, and what they're basically doing is building the periodic table in front of you. But you'll see how these things align themselves. Well, this is the swarm. Uh, we see a CGI video of five of these linchpins, and they're all following this queen, and they'll do everything that she's doing. This is four of them that's going to come together to pick up a barrel. And so what he does is like he's got four, four of these linchpin shapes that arrange themselves in such a way that they create a, uh, like a dodecahedron in, in between them. And then a little grabber arm comes out of nowhere to pick up a barrel somehow. <laughs> in the video. But it's you know, it's just a little little CGI video. <coughs> so because Terence Howard has declared but not shown that this is the geometry of hydrogen, these objects can by that virtue alone bond together. Uh, let's see this in action. It's certainly an idea, but there is nothing here to indicate that he has actually put in any effort into the actual mechanics. Perhaps he expects someone else to come along and build these for him while he takes the credit. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe that's a maybe that's a low blow. But yeah, he's not. He hasn't put any actual work into creating these things. He he did make a little video, if he made that video. 
So Joe Rogan asks, what's powering them? Let's uh, go back to where we can uh, take a look at these things. So he says, what's powering them? And Terrence Howard replies, right now they're, they're we're going to use hydrogen fuel cells, but I have another system, you know, that I was going to talk about in a second. It's an unlimited source of power. Or you can use lithium batteries. Use them to clean the upper atmosphere and mine the asteroid belt. You try to go that far away, that's like taking a starfish from the bottom of the ocean. Everything expands, the nitrogen expands too much, that animal dies. You take us outside where Mars is, nitrogen has expanded so much more. The hydrogen has expanded so much more that you will never be able to, you won't even have a spaceship or a suit that's strong enough to keep your body together. You will never be able to come back to 93 million miles away from the sun because everything will have expanded and you will expand to the point of something and explode out. So trying to send a man to Mars is like trying to send a man to live on Venus. The pressure is too tight near Venus and you will get crushed in a second. It's like being pushed to the bottom of the ocean immediately. You will get crushed immediately. The pressure conditions change as we move from the sun, but science have neglected that because they've said it's a void there, but they didn't account for that higher pressure condition, but they found that radioactive decay is quicker closer to the sun near Venus. Why? Because the pressure condition, that electric field, those magnetic fields are pushing on each other, causing it to turn back into an electric force in comparison to further away when the earth is closer to the sun. They found that radioactive decay is quicker than when it's further away from the sun. Is that by accident or is it because of the change of pressure conditions? Uh, so his unlimited power source is the same thing as his projectileless lightning gun. Uh, and from everything that he said about it, it has no factual basis. Uh, Terence Howard is confusing Walter Russell's ideas of elements of unwinding with nitrogen having more freedom of movement when under less actual pressure, which causes the bends and causes it to boil. Uh, so Terence Howard says, are we going to be able to put people on Saturn? No, it's too nebulous. It's expanded out too far. Our pressure conditions, we would have to have a suit so strong and powerful in order for us to do that. But Lynchpin is able to make it out there because we have another propulsion system that we've put together where I'm able to take water and put into, into it a small change. And this patent has been granted. It's the propulsion projectile. And we patented it as a gun because I didn't want anybody else to use it like a gun. We patented it as a gun because I didn't want anybody else to use it or else to be able to use it like a gun. Oh, I see. Yeah. But it's basically lightning in a bottle. You take water and you put it inside of a small chamber based on wave conjugations that I have and the angles of incidence and we run an electric charge through a small amount of water. Water is not able to expand into gas like it wants because it's locked into the pressure condition so immediately it converts into plasma and it converts into the gas dimension into a power dimension so it's lightning out of a barrel just from water and there's no in and the patent's been granted. Typically, you're limited to how much charge you can put inside of a cartridge, and you know you have to get more charge or explosive in there to get something out, but with electricity, you can send a thousand volts or a million volts through the same aperture, and that water is incompressible, so it's just going to react, and immediately it converts into a plasma, and so it's we can project anything into space. All of that has been accomplished, and it's ignored. What a claim. Okay. So. What do, what do we want to look at here? Um, oh, right. The patents. 
Let's look at his patents. There are three patents here. Diamond earring with washer, diamond jewelry, and system and method for merging virtual reality and reality to provide an enhanced sens sensory experience. Where's the lightning gun? I don't see it. So the linchpin apparently doesn't get expanded by these speculative changing pressure conditions, even though it's hydrogen, apparently. Uh, or maybe it does, but there's some special not described way that it manages to be fine with the expansion because it was declared that it could, so therefore it must be so. A patent granted for a small chamber with water in it that when charged with electricity converts into a plasma and makes lightning greater than the amount of electricity put into it because of concave polyhedrons. It's a gun without a projectile, but it's also a propulsion system, an unlimited source of power. And what generates the initial charge? What modulates the charge? What directs the energy conservation breaking lightning in the proper direction? And how does this propel the linchpin around? Which parts of the linchpin engines need to shoot lightning out of them to what degree to maintain stable flight? Will this proposed method of propulsion work in a vacuum? All right, Terence Howard doesn't believe in a vacuum. Space isn't mostly empty, it's full of ether. So no need to take into consideration different forms of propulsion. In fact, according to that, a propeller would work just as well in space, pushing the ether through it instead of water or air. It's a shame that rocket scientists don't know that they can just use normal turbine and propellers and turbines and propellers in space because of the ether. Terence Howard claims that the patent has been granted, and yet of the three patents that Terence Howard has actually applied for, none of them were granted because all three of them were abandoned, and two of them were for jewelry. So his claim that the patent has been granted is false. He claims all of them or all of that has been accomplished. Well, if that's true, let's see it. Terence Howard says, it's nothing but moisture in that collected ice, collected and ice in there. So you can now, the linchpins can go all the way past Mars, attach themselves to whatever asteroid, mine that asteroid, bring it back, and have in one of the Lagrange areas Lagrange areas are those areas where two, where multiple magnetic fields meet, then there's no weight to something, another death blow to gravity. It's the fact that it's not a constant. <coughs> it could not be a constant because things were way heavier on the poles of the Earth, on the surface of the poles, than it does at the equator. They're heavier at the poles than they are at the equator, and the further away from the Earth you go, the less it goes, so there's no consistency about gravity. It's not a constant, it's a coefficient, and more so, it's just an effect. And it's the same thing with the Planck scale. You look at the Planck scale, or the Planck length, or the Planck weight, all those things are based on gravity, and they're supposed to occur at 10 to the negative 15, the Planck scale, but at 10 to the negative 35 is where the proton and all that behaves. They have gravity inside there as if it's affecting it, but they already said at small molecular level, you know, that the nuclear level, gravity has no effect. So how's that a part of the Planck scale? All right, let's address this. One sec, I need more water. All righty. <coughs> so Lagrange points are defined as an equilibrium point between two massive bodies. It is not, in fact, a death blow to gravity. It is where two forces of gravity are pulling with equal amounts of force in opposite directions. Gravity isn't a constant. The force varies by mass and distance, as seen in the equation for gravity, which includes a gravitational constant, which is the amount of force per given mass which decreases over distance. Let's go back to the drawing board here. So if you have a force, right, we can pretend that this is a small square section 
of a curved surface, right? So let's draw some little curves on it. So this is a this is a just a little piece of a sphere, and as you expand your sphere outward, it gets to become a bigger sphere. So here's our square section of a sphere. And as you go outward, if we draw this square at the same exact size, about right here is where it now has one quarter of the strength that the field had right here. And we can keep drawing these with like 16 squares here. And this is how gravity weakens over distance because you're taking the same amount of force and applying it to a greater area because you've got a sphere, right? And as you expand that sphere, this little piece right here is expanding to affect this area over here. And it is the radius squared underneath the, the gravitational constant and the, the masses, m1, m2, something like that. It's probably like pi involved in there or something. I don't know. But uh, this is the, the, the basis of the, of the gravitational equation. There's probably something more to it. I'm just, I haven't looked at that equation in a long time. So I don't know it directly off the top of my head, but that's pretty close. You've got a gravitational constant, you've got the distance squared, and you've got the two masses in relation to each other, equaling the force of gravity. That's not the actual equation, but you get the idea. Okay. So it decreases uh, over the distance because it's spreading out the same amount of force over a larger area. And you can tell that Terence Howard doesn't understand what the word coefficient means because here's a brief description of the word coefficient. Coefficient in mathematics or sorry, coefficient. In mathematics, a coefficient is a number or any symbol representing a constant value that is multiplied by the variable of a single term or terms of a polynomial. It is usually a number, but sometimes may be replaced by a letter in an expression. So a coefficient is a constant. The gravitational constant is a coefficient. Terence Howard said that gravity couldn't be a constant because it's a coefficient. He got it backwards. Uh, gravity is a relatively weak force, which is very apparent at small scales. Having a negligible effect is not the same as having no effect. Next, Terence Howard says that the speed of light isn't a constant because there were variations in the measurements of the speed of light and because it changes based on the medium that it's in. He refers to scientific consensus on the speed of light as intellectual phase locking. Don't let the big words bamboozle you. Let's look at a little history on measuring the speed of light. Empedocles in ancient Greece, suggested that light took time to travel. I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name, but Ole Romer was the first known to make a prediction and measure a delay in the travel of light, which was otherwise thought to be instantaneous. Isaac Newton wrote that it takes seven to eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to the earth. Michael J. Crow
calculated a speed of light of 201,168,000 meters per second. The error being one of the values of his equation, right? So error was 22 when it was supposed to be 16. And that accounts for just about that much error. Uh, James Bradley Uh, through a truly ingenious thought experiment, concluded that the speed of light must be 297,729,000 meters per second. And then you have Fizeau, let's pr spell this A E, Fizeau and Foucault. who were French, and they were competing, and both separately directly measured the speed of light. This is the first time that the speed of light has been directly measured. This guy was just n in a, a genius, a little genius. So Fizeau Foucault uh, created uh, some very simple setups involving mirrors and rotating gears, and they measured the speed of light both of them measured the exact same value of 298 million meters per second. Albert Mickelson expanded on Foucault's method of direct measurement using better equipment and greater distances and measured it to be 298 million 299,960 meters per second. The current measurement that we, uh, that we use today, which was a direct measurement of the speed of light, was first done in 1972 using exceptionally precise equipment like interferometers, and it provo provided a result of 299,792,458 meters per second. Now notice it's not squared because it's not an acceleration. It's a speed. That is the speed of light as accurately as we have measured it today. And Newton, genius, guessed <laughs> basically through thought experiment that it took seven or eight minutes based on Romer observations of the moons and Saturn and the way that the, that the took the, t the time it took for the light from those moons to reach the earth some wild wild ideas now his idea uh, old, old Romer didn't quite get it well. Newton nearly nailed it. Michael Crow would have nailed it if he had just used the right number. James Bradley nearly nailed it just thinking about it. Fuzo and Foucault measured it. Albert Mickelson did a better job of measuring it with more precise instruments. And today we used the most precise instruments and we have a very, very close approximation to the actual speed. Now again, our measurements are not the actual speed. It's just the closest that we've come to the speed of light. And that's science. That's real science. And it's awesome. Okay. <clears throat> Terence Howard says, but it's never been a constant because it changes depending on the medium it's going through. So there's no constant there, but they have that as part of the Planck scale. But the linchpin and wave conjugations, tetrion, tetraterion, I mean, it's the end of Planck. It's the end of Schrodinger's equations. It's the end of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And I'm ready to have a debate at any university, but they 
gave no comeback for it because I have four super symmetrical systems. I, I put gave, I think he said, I, but they have, but they have no comeback for it, he says, because I have four super symmetrical systems. And that's the thing about geometry. Geometry is its own proof. Supersymmetry is its own proof. Whereas equations, anybody can have an equation and only certain people can try to understand it and it can be fudged with renormalization or any time you have an infinity, they renormalize it. All of them recognized this is fudging because they had went the wrong direction by taking the ether out of the equation. Now I have the proof of the ether and how it behaves. Okay. So the reason that light changes its apparent speed, right? So here we have our light wave. And if we just take a little slice here, uh, this slice, we'll call this a photon. This, this is our little wave packet here. And the speed that this thing is going, okay? So the reason that light changes its apparent speed when traveling through a denser medium is due to interactions within the medium. The light is absorbed by the electrons in the atoms of the medium and then emitted by the electrons. This absorption and emission is not instantaneous. And this accounts for light appearing to move slower. The speed at which light moves when not interacting with the atoms remains the same. So the denser your medium, the more times the light is going to get absorbed and then re-emitted, which makes it appear to be moving slower because it needs to, th there's time where it gets absorbed and then a time where it gets emitted again and then it's going still light speed in each one of these little sections. Also, geometry is its own proof. Yes, it proves that the shape can exist. So the geometry of a cube proves that there are cubes. Check it out. That is a proof that a cube has 90 degree angles in it. It's a proof that a cube has six faces. And there are eight vertices. And there are 12 lines. That's what, a, that's what the geometry of a cube proves. Oh, it also proves that it can tessellate space infinitely, just like Terence Howard's linchpin can. And that's why we use cubes, because they're a really simple geometry that tessellates space. Terence Howard's uh, linchpin shape made of pentagons also tessellates space, which is pretty cool. It's another way to tessellate space, but it's a lot more complicated than measuring stuff with a cube. Okay. Uh, also, renormalization isn't fudging. It is replacing theoretical values with actual measured values because I mean, you, you could argue you could argue that it's fudging, I guess. But what's happening is you have an equation, right? And this equation is trying to be a model of reality at really, really small scales that we call the quantum scale, like electrons. Electrons exist on the quantum scale, right? We have equations that are trying to describe wha what electrons do at the quantum scale. And when that uh, equation accounts for 8 trillion electrons, 
versus one electron. If you're off, okay, so eight, eight trillion, right? Eight trillion electrons is this many electrons, right? Uh, one more, I think. That's thousand, million, billion, tri oh, no, that was, that was good, that was good. That's thousand, that's million, that's billion, this is trillion. So when you have eight trillion electrons, if you're off by 1% of the actual value, or you know, if your equation is off by 1% on its data, that's over here. That's 10 million more electrons than there actually are, right? And believe it or not, eight trillion electrons is not that many. If your equation is off by 0.001% and you have this many electrons, that you're measuring at the macro scale. Well, 0.001%, 1% would be here. So two more zeros, a zero and a zero, puts it here. So here you have one, two, three, that's thousand, million, billion. So now you have 10 trillion more electrons than you're supposed to have in your equation. Now that's a very simplified explanation of what's going on. What's really going on is that the they're, you know, they're doing like multiplications of these values too. So it's not just addition. You are multiplying the, uh, the force of the electrons and you end up getting values that approach infinity. But we know that a basketball and a piece of paper with positively charged ions and negatively charged ions don't have infinite force between them. We know what the force, the electric force is between these objects based on Coulomb's law. So what we, d and, and by measurement, right? So what we do is when we get this infinity because our mass of the, mass of the electron was off by maybe 0.001% or maybe less. I, d I don't even know the actual percentage it's off, but you know, you're, you're gonna be off at some, some point, right? Because you're theorizing here. And it works on the one electron scale with no problems. But when you blow it up to the size of a basketball, suddenly you get these infinite values. You know that there is no actual infinite amount of uh, electron force there, so you take the actual measured force of electrons the actual measurements and you put and you plug those into that same equation that you were using at the quantum scale to use it at the macro scale so that it gives you the right results that's what renormalization is it's a very small error at a small scale is meaningless and at a large scale, a very small error can go to infinity. So that's renormalization in a nutshell.